Division of Quantum Mechanics will give the last seminar talk in this experimental seminar on the foundations of quantum mechanics. All right, thanks, Dr. Zilberger, for inviting me, and thank you for Mija for the talk. Um, first of all, I'm not a uh, foremost expert, so I'm just beginning a uh, student of this all. And um, I found this subject very fascinating. That's why uh, I've been studying this with Shelley and Michael for the past few years. And um, I hope that this topic can be interesting to other people outside, uh, people who are working at natural physics and philosophy of science, because I think that um, you know, quantum theory seems to be very central to our uh, scientific worldview these days. But a lot of that seems to be very confusing and mysterious, and they presented in, say, physics classes and popular press. Um, so I hope to do um, some um, work today to clarify some of these understandings and also trying to um, um, give some further references about what to read if you're interested in this topic. Okay. So, um, um, well, thank you all for coming. And I hope that uh, this talk will be very brief, but I hope to um, you know, give you some pointers about what the problem is and what the solutions are. Um, to me, it seems to me that um, the quantum measurement problem is at the heart of the mysteries of quantum mechanics. And um, uh, I want to illustrate the measurement problem through a series of three very simple thought experiments. Um, and, um, you know, um, and we can see that with some uh, precise mathematical framework, we understand this a bit more, but still the measurement problem is not solved until we go beyond what is presented in textbook quantum mechanics. Um, so that's one of the goals today, is to see one particular solution to the measurement problem, um, namely Bohmian mechanics. Okay, so um, the goal for a lot of foundation quantum mechanics is to find a clear, uh, precise mathematical physical theory of the world. And um, the vision we have is based on, say, the uh, classical theory of particles and fields developed by Newton, uh, Lagrange, Hamilton, and so on, in which there's a very clear theory. A theory with not only laws of motion, like F equals MA, but also an ontology of what there is in the world. So in the classical world, we have tables and chairs that compose of, say, small particles and planets um, are composed of smaller parts and particles and so on. And there are forces between small parts. And they have interactions. And they'll create motion by Hamiltonian formalism or, say, Lagrange formalism. And that is the you know, explanation, the clear picture of what the world is about. And the ontology picture seems to be missing in much presentation of quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we are often, you know, face the question, what's really going on in this simple experiment? Can we say something definite and precise about the, um, say, the apparatus and the system being measured and the interaction between them and so on? And it's very hard because um, quantum mechanics itself seems to be lacking in both mathematical and considerable tools to do that. Okay. So um, I want to go through some examples. The first one is um, the single slit experiment. So in this one. Okay. So we'll start with this one to simplify uh, one experiment, but it's very illustrative for later calculations and uh, thinking through this. So in this experiment, we have what is called electron gum. Basically, you have uh, some battery here. Um, you know, you have a wire system and two sides, the opposite, uh, opposite sides of the battery, and they're shooting the electrons one by one um, on some technologies. So you have electrons shooting emitting from this um, electron gun, and um, you know, we expect and we see this pattern on the screen. Basically, you have many uh, flashes one by one on the screen. And as you go through this many times, you'll see a pattern forming. There are more particles landing here, where it's the center of the uh, slit, and fewer here. But in general, you see this bell-shaped pattern distribution. And this is empirical distribution of, say, doing experiments thousands of times. 
Now, um, this seemed to be, you know, well within our expectations. And classically, we could, for example, shoot um, bullets um, through this one. I suppose bullets are, you know, randomly distributed across, say, uh, uh, these parts. And they can be different directions, but um, if you have a reliable mechanism, it's most likely to be in this part, sometimes be uh, moving around, uh, reflected by this edge to here, and so on. But most of the bullets are going to arrive in this part, this way. So it seems like nothing surprising has happened yet. Um, until we have two slits. So in this experiment, we have the same electron gun, two electrons one by one, so it can be further away. So it's not always in here. Um, it's far away, and if these two are close enough, and also small enough, then we see uh, something else. But given this single slit experiment, we might expect that, um, you know, for example, um, uh, if the electron goes through the slit one by one, and go through one of them at a time, say, um, see, uh, the upper slit and the lower slit, So you like from, um, you know, one go through the upper slit, then you might something around here, right? And you like on two go through the lower slit, you might something something around here. Suppose you have hundreds of electrons going through this and this, you may have half of them going through upper slit, half of them going through lower slit by the symmetry of the experiment. And you might see maybe something like that happening, the two bell shaped curves. Maybe uh, you have this where you center around this slit, and you have this. Center around this. Slit. And together, if both are open, you might expect to see something like this. Where uh, this is the addition of the two uh, bell, uh, bell curves. And um, deep in the middle. The deep in the middle. Like but in any case, it's continuous, right? It's continuous distribution. You just simply add this to your gallery. Okay. But that's not what actually happens in the lab or in this thought experiment. What actually happens if you do the experiment is something like this you have a discrete pattern. Where some parts has many, many particles hidden on the screen. And some other parts get almost no electrons hidden on the screen. So instead of a continuous distribution, you have a discrete distribution. And you might ask yourself, what explains this phenomenon? And what explains the, the kind of uh, uh, difference between this picture and this picture? by applying the assumption that particles go through one of the slits, and um, when it goes to this one, when this is open, doesn't affect the trajectory that it happens. So um, that's the question you will see presented in, say, five minutes lectures and other textbooks we see. It seems to be a very big mystery of quantum mechanics. And some people even say it's the only mystery as fine as say. So, um, well, if you think about this long well enough, you realize maybe electrons are not quite like particles. So maybe um, this indicates some kind of wavy things going on, some kind of interference patterns going on. Because if you imagine this not an electron gun, but some kind of um, water waves here. And the water waves being kind of agitated here, you're producing some waves going through this one, almost like a plane wave going through this one, and then have diffraction from the two slits, right? Um, and there will be some parts when you hit the screen that have constructive interference and some parts that have destructive interference. So in that case, we might have um, a water wave forming on, the, on this part of the screen. You have uh, you know, some more water here, maybe less you know, uh, up and down here, more up and down here, less up and down here. 
But um, um, you know, the wave phenomena is going to be recalling for extra ingredients or magnetic representations. The particle we still to be have definite location, say Q, at this point. But it's a wave phenomena. Maybe we need something else. So what is representing the wave here in quantum mechanics for the electrons is going to be something called a wave function. For a single particle, it's going to be a function from um, R3, three-dimensional space, in this case maybe R2, because we have just two-dimensional rotation, to some complex numbers. And these numbers can be, you know, um, R equal to I theta. So you have the modulo and the phase of the complex numbers. And um, when, um, say, you have two parts, of the um, waves. You have, say, uh, psi 1 and psi 2. And if this is evolving time by um, some linear evolution, we say that more for that later, then we will find some parts of the wave will be interfering to be constructive, some parts of which will be destructive. That correspond to the values in which, say, um, you, know, you have on a complex plane uh, two vectors. One in which, uh, at one point, it might be aligned in the same direction, it's the same phase. Then you have constructive interference. So one place that you have the outer phase completely by one uh, by a pi. Uh, then you'll be destructive interference. You have complete zero, cancels out. So um, we have a wave um, function here that seems to explain a little bit of the interference patterns on the screen. Okay. So you have say um, R one. E i theta 1 and R2, E i theta 2. So if theta 1 is, say, uh, theta 2 minus pi, then it will be destructive and you would get 0 here. If theta 1 is the same direction as theta 2, then it will be constructive. It will be adding more. So this place will be constructive and this place will be destructive interference. Okay. So the first step is to add this wave function to represent the system, the electron system. Um, and you might ask, what is the exact equation of change for the wave function? And that was given by uh, Schrodinger's equation, which is the type of the equations of this form. Some change of the wave function in time, given by some operator times the wave function. You can take one wave to another wave function. Um, but this one is going, sorry, it's going to take one wave function um, and then producing some kind of uh, velocity, uh, different changes to the wave function. And for, say, um, uh, non-relativistic quantum system, you have um, this product, which is, say, uh, the gradient squares of the Laplacian. You have h bar, which is the uh, Planck constant, and mk is the, um, um, the mass of the electron, with v potential. Right. So in this case, we can think of this as saying, um, given by the construction, potential is given by, say, um, maybe it's infinite here, or this is going to be um, complete block in the wave function. So this is going to entail uh, this important property of this change of wave function. And we have h bar squared. Um, sorry. And why do you have a k index of there? Yeah. Yeah, single wave function. Yeah, single part of wave function. Then um, the important feature of this equation is that it is linear. That is, if um, say um, psi one um, index by t is solution to this equation, then s psi two index by t solution to this equation, then the um, linear combination of the two will be another solution to this equation. So, for example, some constant alpha plus theta psi 2 will be another solution to this equation. Okay. Now, we know from the single slit experiment, we have the following features. If we close this slit, just let uh, this part to be open, then we're going to have a change to be, um, you know, like giving you something like a diffraction pattern on the screen, like this. And you let this, happen, uh, this open and this close, 
you can have a different kind of like this. So if you like both slits be open, then um, the prediction, the Schrodinger equation, is that the two, you know, psi one, psi two, is going to add the linear way, and the, the evolution is going to be, you know, um, preserving the independent of two ways. So what you have is going to be psi one plus psi two at all times. Now, since psi one, psi two are complex number of functions, we're going to have uh, at some points, they're going to be in phase, be constructed, and at some point they're going to be out of phase to be destructive. So at some point they'll be you know, uh, adding more to the amplitude, some parts be adding little to the amplitude to be zero. Okay. Right. So um, if this is you know the entire description of the system, we might have the problem. That is, when we do a single experiment we see just one flash in the screen. Not kind of mushy phenomena. Not kind of like um, entirety of you know, uh, flashes, but just one flash in the screen. And um, already you can see that just by the wave function plus the Schrodinger equation, we don't quite know how to explain this precise, uh, discrete kind of pattern on the screen one by one. Although, the prediction of quantum mechanics is going to add, us, add more things to it. It's not only the wave function plus the Schrodinger equation, but some other rules for extracting predictions, namely collapse the wave function and parental probabilities. Um, but in any case, I want to leave this as a kind of uh, indicator for something missing here. Now, to go to um, the third experiment, we're going to add something else here. So in this third experiment, it's called um, the double slip with some monitor in the middle. So electrons are attracted to protons with a positive charge. Um, so if we have a proton here with positive charge, suppose we have some kind of device here. If it moves this way, there's a flash here. Move this way, there's a flash here. So suppose we have an electron coming out of the um, electron gun one by one. Now, with this monitor, we're going to see exactly which way, or which way the electron goes through. Suppose we have a perfect correlation of the uh, proton. That is exactly, if you go through this one, would 100% of the time come to this one. And that means we're going to have perfect monitoring of the which way information of the electron. So suppose we have um, you know, detection here, then we know it's coming here, some probably something arriving here. Okay. With this introduced in the experiment, um, we, assume, we assume that maybe we'll still have interference pattern on the screen, but just we'll have more measurement of the uh, experiment. Maybe we can know if they come this way, you will first flash here. But no, what actually happens with additional device here added is that you have um, simply the addition of two bell shaped curves. Exactly what you had expected from this one plus two slits, right? Plus extra slit. So, uh, 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 what, what's the difference between the, uh, this thing in the middle? Yeah. Uh, so, is, uh, is it a email or some kind of device? It's kind uh, of what? It's a lens or something? It's, it's not a lens, it's kind of a, um, say, a small uh, you know, pro uh, device measuring the, dire the direction of the proton. The proton can move up and down oh. in this thing. So if the electron comes this way, be I try to do here, kind of emit a, uh, a flash here. If the electron goes this way, then you're going to emit a flash over here. And so it indicates thing? exactly whether it's going through upper or lower slit. And so it's an indicator for which slit the electron goes through. And then the actual experiment that people did in the lab. Yeah, no, they can do this one experiment. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, and you can do the experiment, you'll see that the interference patterns is gone, it disappeared. Um, which is weird. It's like, um, so someone um, said, I think Finan says this too, it's like by looking or by seeing this uh, electron, um, the electron knows that you're seeing it, so it kind of destroys the interference patterns. Anyways, I think um, that's not the best way to think about it, but um, it is surprising, nonetheless, to have a monitoring device in the middle 
then insurance patterns go. And by the way, by making this less and less reliable, and this pattern will become more and more like interference pattern. So if something's precise, not matter going on, but um, just by looking at this experiment, it's quite puzzling. So three experiments, the single slit, the double slit, double slit plus the monitor of which way you have to go through, they show some kind of uh, weird microscopic quantum phenomenon going on. And um, already at this point, we said the interference patterns cause out for explanation, namely to represent the system by a wave like moment, a wave function. And we postulate this wave function obeying a Schrodinger equation, which is linear in time, which kind of explains in part at least interference patterns. Now, the third one causes out for explanation as well. But uh, let me just give you a brief partial explanation in terms of the mathematics of wave function. So in this experiment, we still have, say, um, the wave function of electron going through here. Right? However, um, it's going to interact with the proton here, such that um, the wave function of the system is going to be divided into, divided into two parts. Now, to represent this, we think about the following. So when you have a two-particle system, so um, E and P, um, where this is the position X, E, Y, E, and Z, E. Let's think about this two-dimension for now. So the location of the electron can be you know, in different X, Y coordinates. And proton two. But proton only has one dimension variable, either up or down. So uh, it's going to be represented by, say, this one thing. Um, let's say, um, um, and Z, P. So two degrees of freedom for the electron, going uh, either this way or this way. For proton, going on this way. Well, in reality, it's three-dimensional, right? Three here and three here. But the relevant information is only two numbers here, one number here. And um, the wave function of the system is no longer a function um, from R2 to C, but from R3 to C. So the, the wave function is going to be a function of x e, y e, and z p. So for every way the electron proton systems are arranged in space, there is a compact number. Right. Um, so in this picture, we're going to have a three-dimensional representation. Oh, okay. I know space. Can you draw it here? So what's happened here, mathematically, we can briefly see as follows. You have a three-dimensional configuration space. You have, um, say, um, Say this x e, y e, and z p. So x and y you can think about the two ways that the electron can move around, and z is the one way that the proton can move around. Then you have a, a wave function, um, say um, you know a plane wave um, coming in from here. Okay around the point of interaction between the proton and electron, we're going to have um, two ways the proton can be. One in which it's going to be like this. Um, one in which the proton moves down. So we go from two-dimensional configuration space to three-dimensional configuration space, in which there are going to be two distinct parts of the wave function spreading uh, in this space. 
Now, um, so because there's two parts, the wave function are kind of far away, there's not going to be the constructive or destructive interference between the two parts. Unlike this one, where um, you know when you have interaction, diffraction from here, they're going to have uh, interference in the same plane. That's a crucial difference between this picture and this picture, when the interference pattern is lost here. And as you, uh, you know, the reliability of that becomes lower, you can see this coming, becoming uh, uh, closer, they'll be producing more interference. But given a perfectly reliable indicator, we're going to have two distinct parts of the wave function being not interfering much with each other. Okay, so this is exactly what I'm focused on now because it illustrates the quantum measurement problem very nicely. Um, okay. So when we have, um, you know, the wave function in the system, say, um, uh, say, e one um, plus say e two and say phi of the monitor p. Um, ready this way. So the ready state of the monitor. So we know that if we have just, um, um, say, psi u1 going through the upper slope, then you're going to measure um, up. If you're going to go through the lower slope, you're going to measure uh, down. So I'm going to write this down. Okay. Um, can you see it here? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the first fact we know is that suppose psi e um, up, and then we have say the wave of the, uh, the monitor is phi ready, and this will evolve into psi e up plus uh, uh, phi uh, indicates up. Also, we know that if this is psi e down and phi ready, we're going to evolve into um, psi e down and phi indicates down. It's a reliable indicator. Right? So when we combine these two together, by the linear Schrodinger equation, we're going to have this one. So position with two between two parts uh, with phi ready, it's going to evolve to psi um, up and phi indicates up plus psi down and phi indicates down. Okay. So by the wave function evolving linearly by the Schrodinger equation, we have this result of the experiment. But that seems to be inconsistent with observation, in which we have a definite outcome of the experiment, namely it's either up or down. It indicates up from a flash here, we indicate down from a flash here. And this is not in case up where it is come. It is position of the two. Um, part of the wave function. So, um, what we have here is a simple illustration of the conflict between um, amount three propositions. We have here the measurement problem. So, if the wave function completely describes the physical system, then proposition one is the wave function is everything. The second, if the wave function always obeys the linear Schrodinger equation, and showing you is always exact, universal, describe the phenomenon not only the moving parts, but also the interaction between the system and the uh, measuring device. Then we have the second proposition. Showing your question is universal and exact. But given these two propositions, we have the following um, uh, prediction, namely that this will be the end result of the experiment, not particularly up indicator or down indicator. So 
These two are in conflict with the following th third proposition, that all kinds of experiments are definite, either up, down, left, right. Okay. So um, the three propositions are in conflict, not bad. And um, the way, go way to go is not to give up, say, classical logic or probability theory, but you think whether you can give up any one of the three propositions. So, in what remains, I'm going to briefly mention one strategy to solve the measurement problem. Namely, so you have to pick a certain subset of this, possibly the empty set. That's right, yeah, maybe nothing can solve the problem. But um, we can still first try to see whether we can give up this one, or give up this one, give up this one. So, by the way, let me mention that if you give up this one, you have uh, to add extra features, extra ontologies, uh, particles, or fields, or what have you. And uh, one particular version is called Bowman mechanics, given by De Broglie and Bowman. Um, so they have the wave function, and also you have particle locations too. You have extra particles with precise locations that move according to the wave function. The second strategy is to give up uh, the universality or exactness of Schrodinger equation, you might run into something called uh, the GRW formalism of quantum mechanics. It's a different way, different theory of quantum mechanics. I mean, this one's different too, but this one modifies the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation is not always exact. It should be given up by something like a um, stochastic evolution with spontaneous collapses. The third one is the uh, very infamous picture of Everett. We deny that there's no bad outcome experiments, maybe all of them are equally real in some sense. The many worlds interpretation in which say not only uh, there's a world in which you see this up, but also there's a world in which you see this down. So three propositions points out to you three ways to deny uh, to, to give up um, something kind of uh, seem to be standard orthodoxy. And um, we we'll focus on this one first. Raleigh Baum formalism. What about the orthodox approach, the Copenhagen? Yeah, Which so um, it's hard to pin down exactly what Copenhagen says because the Copenhagen interpretation um, is kind of a collection of sayings of Bohr and Heisenberg, Pauli and others. It's not always consistent. So one way to understand this, I think, is that there's no, there's no microscopic world. So it is foolish and um, uh, it is hopeless to insist on an exact picture of the world at the fundamental level. So we can talk about tables and chairs, but don't talk about the location of particles. So if you do talk about them, you have to, to talk about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, but there's also variations in which you might have Copenhagen with a collapse postulate, um, some kind of uh, you know, observer-induced collapses. Right. So there are many versions of Copenhagen, and um, it's not very clear what they mean exactly. Right. But sometimes I think they want to say the Schrodinger equation is not always exact to have collapses. What, what's kind of um, measure the device by observing the electrons, say, in the third experiment, or say, on the screen. Okay, so the Bowling mechanics. So Bowling theory suggests that maybe, uh, well, let's try first, that if wave is not everything, it seems like when you have wave phenomena, the interference, and appearing or disappearing, um, we also have particle phenomena. You have a particle landing here. You have a flash at this landing here, right? A flash here, a flash here. Even in this case, we have this curve is not like something we observe uh, directly, but it's only um, by accumulating flashes on the screen. How many flashes are here? We have more here, so it's a higher curve here. Even, so the flash on the screen. Even in the first case. Yeah, in the first place, you have a flash on the screen. It's more direct. It's just that the wave phenomenon is not so obvious there. When you have wave phenomena, you also have particle phenomena. It seems like maybe you need both. You have the wave function doing the thing by the Schrodinger equation, interfering, 
constructively or destructively, giving you interference patterns, or you've given you say, two parts of the wave functions. You also have particles doing that thing, moving along somehow, and um, landing on the screen. And the, the, the idea is that you, um, the wave function is not everything. So we have this wave function describing the wave phenomena, but also the particle Q, so particles in pre specific locations, say um, uh, Q1 and Q2 and uh, up to Qn in the particle system. So Q1 is x, y is equal to of the first particle, Q2 is x, y is equal to the third part, the second particle, and so on. And this together is called a configuration, the way that particles are arranged in space. And there's going to be a precise equation of how the configuration of particles change. Um, and that's given by what is called a guidance equation. So, you know, um, um, yeah, let me just write down the guidance equation. Q okay. Okay, that's constant, right? Okay. So sorry, um, so this means the velocity of the K particle is given by some constant in front. Uh, and some imaginary parts of operation. Uh, basically, the most important thing is here, the gradient of the wave function. So uh, the thought is this. If you want to have uh, a simple, but well, most natural um, velocity of particles, velocity equation of particles, then you can get it from the wave function. Um, but the wave function is the scalar field, say in complex case, scalar field on configuration space. And um, the easiest way to get the velocity field from the scalar uh, function is by taking the gradient of the scalar field. Which means, um, suppose we have a scalar field uh, kind of um, like this, then the gradient will be pointing to um, the steepest way of ascent. Right? Um, and this means that with velocity field, we have a vector field uh, arising from the scalar field by taking the gradient. But also we want to have basically that um, wave functions deferred by a constant over a phase giving the same velocity field. So when we have a gradient of psi, we divide it by psi itself, which will cancel out any constant factor of the wave function. But this could be in general a complex number, so we take the uh, imaginary part we give a real number, so real velocity field, with some constant in front. Okay. And that's the basic idea behind the guidance equation. Right. And then there's other hey, arguments hey, about... Uh, your explanation doesn't just define why you take the imaginary part, why don't you just take the real part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so there are two ways to do it, either taking the imaginary part or real parts. Um, so, I think taking the imaginary part is by the choice of some symmetries, um, or um, no, that's how you get the continuity equation. You right, I see. I see. I see. No, he's right. He's right. Symmetry, but it's a time reversal symmetry. I see. Yeah. Right. So t to minus t. Right. And the constants you justify by taking symmetry argument of um, boosts and so on. So um, there are natural arguments for why the form of velocity uh, equation is given by this. But in any case, so suppose this is a well-defined physical theory, mathematical physics theory. You have particles, and you have wave function. Wave function evolved by the Schrodinger equation. Particles evolved by what is called a guidance equation. It's basically taking a gradient of the wave function in configuration space. And this two, um, the claim is that this two will be sufficient to explain all of this phenomena once you do the calculation of Hamiltonian, plugging Schrodinger equation, and calculating the vector field by the guidance equation. 
And in fact, we have done calculations of, say, a simple models where you can actually do the calculation of the velocity. And it turns out, exactly, most of the particles will land in this part, this part, this part, this part, and almost none will land in this part. And distribution will exactly be like given by um, the just square of the wave function. Let's assume additional hypothesis that is, um, say, um, given initial wave function of this form, say, of psi, but this indicates, say, um, the amplitude of the wave function. Um, most particles, most initial, um, you know, um, okay. Um, right. So the particles will be given distribution, given by psi mod squared. So the probability of, uh, of say, finding the particle here will be given by the modulus square of the wave function. So with this assumption of the two equations, you can derive that um, the frequencies of, say, particles landing on the screen will be given by exactly the empirical distribution and conforming with the form of, of quantum mechanics. Okay. So um, one thing we can do is to uh, think through more carefully in this case. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, in this case, how do you solve the metron problem? So in this case, where you have the with the monetary device added in, right, and you have a disappearance of interference patterns, and you only observe definite outcomes, so you don't get this by just a quantum mechanical plus Schrodinger equation. What you have is that particles will be added to the wave, and they will follow the uh, current of the wave function, and um, some of them initial ones will go this way, and some of them will go this way, given different initial location of particles. If you go up this way, you will show, uh, first of all, you will show that this one will be indicating up, and the electron will show up in this part of the screen. If it goes down this way, then this one will indicate down, the electron will show up on this part of the screen. So the interference is gone because um, the guiding wave here doesn't have interference from the other parts. And definite outcomes arises because there's an extra, um, extra ingredient in theory, namely particle locations. Particles is locations. They always obey one precise trajectory. So um, given you know, enough initial particles, you can always exactly find there's always going to be um, uh, definite outcomes of experiment plus a distribution like this. Right. So, um, and this can be made more vivid by thinking about even bigger macroscopic systems like Schrodinger's cat, um, and uh, even human beings can be uh, coupled, entangled with the environment, with the quantum system. So, um, I think that's about it in the talk. Right. Let me stop here to see if any questions for clarification. Thank you. So, so which of the three choices is your favorite? So my credence is this. Um, five percent, twenty um, percent, and um, I would say seventy percent. And the third one is maybe something else. <laughs> The fourth line is something else, but mostly is um, my, if I were to bet, I would probably bet on this one. Because, first of all, um, so between this one and this one, so between Jared W and Bohm, um, only Bohm will produce the prediction of quantum mechanics, whenever quantum mechanics make prediction, and Jared W will deviate from that. And a lot of versions of Jared W have been falsified already by experiments. Um, my low credit in this one is because that. Um, you know, it's very hard to make sense of the probability of quantum mechanics if all the outcomes are actual. And the way to make sense of that by Edward and other people like David Deutsch and David Wallace seems quite arbitrary. Um, unlike in this one, the probability can be given by simple arguments, dynamics, and so on. So, um, 
That's why I think this one is, first of all, empirically adequate and also most natural. So in, in the bomb, the body is not at all determini it's deterministic? So both falling mechanics and average and quantum mechanics are deterministic. So, so Einstein may be happy with either of them? You would think, yeah. but Einstein in, uh, in private letters was not so happy. <laughs> when he talked with Stoll himself, he found that this information to be too cheap in some, in some way. Oh, okay. But I think it's, it's actually because he was expecting a local theory of quantum mechanics. Oh, so where I'm happy for different reasons. Right, yeah. right. He wants this to be local, but this one is explicitly not local because here you have the velocity of one particle depends on the velocity, the, the position of all the particles. So you can have uh, far away things make a difference to how, where it goes about this particle. Right. But um, unfortunately for Einstein, the goal of look for non for local theory can be actually is impossible. Um, uh, given Bell's theory, which was published uh, after he died. Right. Oh, so maybe in that respect, we have a book of it. Yeah, maybe he would have yeah. liked this better if he knew about Bell's theory. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what you said is ranking uh, distribution oh, 100% of the world. I would say I would give the second one maybe 2%. <laughs> <laughs> it's that high. <laughs> right. yeah. And the third one, maybe 0%. <laughs> I mean, cause I think they're all, two, two and three are just based on this, you take the mistake that was made of thinking the wave function is everything, which is one of the stupidest thoughts anybody could ever have, and you try to put lipstick on that pig. You're not really biting the bullet, whereas you just say the obvious thing, particles have positions whether you look or not, then you got one. Yeah. 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 All the predictions of quantum mechanics can be done. Right, so um, a nice paper is by Shelley and co-authors, and uh, they are going to show in a very um, rigorous physical mechanical method uh, that given the hypothesis that particle initially should be by, like this, it follows that um, you know, um, um, small subsystems would display the kind of patterns predicted by quantum mechanics. And there's going to be, in principle, uh, unknowability about the location of the particles beyond what's predicted by the wave function distribution. Right. Yeah. And it's not so much that you assume particles are distributed like right, that. Right, right, right. Because if you think about it, you don't even know what you mean by saying the probability distribution, right. the configuration of the universe is that. Yeah. So you, you have to make sense of what that even would mean. Right, right, right. So a large part of that is to make sense of that and typicality statements involving them too. You know, what's nice about this theory is that it just proves so, kind of, um, reduces so many arguments about impossibility. So finding that it is impossible to understand double slit experiment in any classical way. If you mean by classical, meaning there's some definite, definite particles going through the slits, then there is one, namely this. And reduce the possibility, the arguments that uh, it is impossible to think about quantum mechanics in um, a consistent way, or in a single world, or um, um, without collapse, then we have also the proof that this exists, therefore it is possible. Of course, what is left over is to do this for more advanced systems and for particle creation and annihilation quantum field theories and for quantum gravity in the end. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's very promising. It's just that there's so few people working on this that um, we haven't made a lot of progress beyond, um, say, idealized models. And there have to be so few people working on it because you cannot tell physics students to work on it because they don't get a job. Yeah, right. Yeah. But some people still work on it, like you and Eddie. Philosophy of physics yeah. can work on it. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not really a philosopher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Thanks for a beautiful talk.